it's basically how we have learned to love and be loved. So what have you had to do as a child in order to earn love? And one way that I love to be able to sort of break down this, um, uh, this knowledge for people so they can apply it to themselves is just ask a very simple question. Whose love did you crave more when you were growing up, your mum or your dad's? Because this will start to help you to break down the different patterns. Maybe you had a parent that was emotionally unavailable. Maybe you had a parent who was highly critical. Maybe you had a parent who praised you for getting all those high grades or a parent that only gave you attention when you fell over and hurt your knee. And this would all create this pattern of how you believe love should be and how you need to earn it. What story are you telling? Whether you're intentional about it or not, you have an audience and they think in story. The Doug Thompson podcast features diverse storytellers sharing their practical tips for telling the story they need others to envision and trust in order to take a new action. Here's your host, Doug Thompson. Hey everybody. Welcome to another episode of the Doug Thompson Podcast. I am your host, Doug Thompson, and this week I have a guest uh, from across the pond, I guess, as we would say, Lily Walford. Lily, how are you doing today? Hey, I'm great. Thank you. How are you doing? I am wonderful. How does Monday turn out? Because you're like five or six hours ahead of me. I, want, I like, always like getting you know advanced notice of something bad's going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> Well, so far it's been pretty good, so I think you're okay. <laughs> All right, well, great. We we we've had a few challenges getting. This is one of those persistence things because I really like, you know, I'll I'll go a long ways to to get a good story out of this. And Lily and I were talking earlier about some of the challenges we had scheduling this, but we're finally here. Lily, tell us what you do, sort of how we came about to do this, and then we'll take it from there. Yeah. So. Uh... Yeah, how do I describe what I do? So basically, I am a relationship and dating coach with a bit of a twist. So I have um, uh, researched things like behavioral profiling, body language, um, how to read people better than a polygraph machine, basically. And what this has supported me to be able to do is help people to heal from past relationships, stop old um, relationship patterns, to support people to um, avoid narcissistic or manipulative or toxic relationships. And it's also helped me to help people um, enter compatible relationships with ease without people using dating apps and things like that. So for example, one of my clients, she went from a narcissistic relationship that she was in for eight years. And um, within 21 days of working with each other, she healed and she also met her partner who she's still with um, 18 months later. So um, it's quite magical stuff. <laughs> you, 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 uh, yeah, I mean, you have to really enjoy seeing how people's lives change as the before, before and after type thing. So, so I have to wonder, cause, cause I'm uh, like old. And when I, when I, 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 we were talking before, I, you know, I've been married to my wife for 40 years. So I've been out of this game for a long time. How is, how is, this changed over the years because, you know, there, there was, and I know technology enables a lot of things like this, but I don't think there's anything, a lot of people in your role or business um, way back when I started. So how have things changed that uh, where your service is in dire need, which it, I, I know from watching around and things it is that it is. Yeah, I think one thing that has a huge impact on people just in general is this social media because people have lost the ability to connect. But we're not talking necessarily about connecting to other people. We're talking about the connection to ourselves. And all of a sudden we have heard about everyone going through, um, you know, some sort of mental illness and things like that. And it's really simple. We don't have the space to be able to be present anymore. 
you think about it everyone wants to be able to grab onto their phone look on social media you know when people wake up first thing they want to do grab the phone or watch tv or have busy jobs so people don't actually know how to fully connect themselves and what this does is it actually causes a problem in relationships because you can only de- um, connect to someone as deeply as you are connected to yourself so there's that element and also there's um almost with social media there's almost been like a competitive streak of people wanting to go okay my life's amazing (laughs) yeah uh, yeah, that never happens right nobody ever has a bad day on facebook it appears right (laughs) (laughs) exactly that and um what this does is it makes us want to sort of cling on to things like status needing to prove ourselves in order that we're worthy of attention or worthy of um, love or worthy of the next pay rise or whatever that might be and um uh, this has just a huge impact on relationships the way that you see yourself and the way that your life plays out so that's a lot of the work that we tend to do with people well it sounds like you have a lot of unwinding of a story that's been created in the past or you know somehow it's done you know you're, from a storytelling perspective you don't want people to be in this in this the next novel of you know that ends badly right? they, but they get in this pattern they keep writing you know I, I talk to people and they keep getting in like the same type relationship and you know it's like well why don't you change that story but for listening to you it's, it's sort of hard because they're, they're starting trying to change it at the other end instead of themselves and it sounds like we need to start here yeah it's it's deeper because what we tend to find is people love to be able to say okay cool i'm going to change the behavior i'm going to stop dating that type of person and they think that they can battle it out on the conscious level but the problem is you can't you have to go deeper um so the difference between the unconscious mind and the conscious mind is that the unconscious mind is a lot stronger and it's a little bit like the horse of the mind and the conscious mind is more like the rider. So you can turn around to yourself and do the affirmations where you say, oh, I'm a happy person. And you can repeat it again and again, but the horse don't buy it, forget it. Yeah. I, <laughs> so yeah. it's like, so it's needing to talk to the horse so per se. <laughs> no, I like that analogy. And I did a TED talk on sort of this, this dialogue we have. And I did a lot of research on how the mind works and you know, the subconscious mind, it talks to you 24, 7, 365. Like I said, your conscious mind is busy trying to keep you alive. And it has a very short term, like I said, it's it's the jockey riding this. And so it's, it's only good for that race. But the horse has got, you know, what, 28, 24 hours a day, right, telling a different story. I like that. Yeah. And the thing is, the horse, <laughs> call Karen, call the horse, run scripts it goes right this today i need to go here i need to go here i need to go here and here and it will repeat the pattern they love like following the scripts the routines the patterns to the nth degree so as soon as you feel something familiar the subconscious wants to latch onto it so that familiar relationship that familiar feeling or, or emotional um you know, whether you sabotage relationships or whether you go for the same type of relationship again or whatever that might be, you'll return to it. And there's a deeper reason behind that. So (laughs) what we tend to find is, um, I kind of briefly touched on this before when we started our chat, but our identity will influence our reality. So our identity, when we when we actually um, uh, have our identity, we suddenly create standards, we create rules, we create beliefs, and that actually tells us how do we play the game of life, and it gives us the lens of how we see and interact with our reality. But what most people don't talk about is how do we actually create our identities, and it's really simple. Our childhood is where we create our identities. And people often don't really dive into this deep enough. And I'll just sort of simplify it a lot for everyone who's listening today. It's basically how we have learned to love and be loved. So what have you had to do as a child in order to earn love? And one way that I love to be able to sort of break down this um, this knowledge for people so they can apply it to themselves is just ask a very simple question. Whose love did you crave more when you were growing up, your mum or your dad's? 
because this will start to help you to break down the different patterns. Maybe you had a parent that was emotionally unavailable. Maybe you had a parent who was highly critical. Maybe you had a parent who praised you for getting all those high grades or a parent that only gave you attention when you fell over and hurt your knee. And this would all create this pattern of how you believe love should be and how you need to earn it. And this will also impact things like jobs, friendships, and obviously relationships too. So for example, if you're a bit of a people pleaser and you knew that you know to make your uh, parents happy, you, you went and made them cups of tea all the time. <laughs> <laughs> and you know you you hoovered the house and you swept the floor and you did the dishes or well, guess what you would go into a job and you would look for that approval within your job you'll be doing everything to make your boss approve of you you will also go into relationships and do everything to get that approval in relationships um you'll often feel resentment because you don't feel people appreciating you in the right kind of way friendships you'll probably struggle with boundaries and that's just one example of how um you know different behaviors of how we talk how we are taught to love and be loved can influence so many different areas of life so do you do you encounter a lot of people which because that's hard uh, the, the cha mm. changing this stuff here that's been ingrained in us and and as you said the the subconscious it's like a subroutine when it sees something it recognizes it automatically goes back through the same patterns. And it's, it's the way we get through life because we don't have enough conscious and active brain power to, to, to keep everything in the air. So we have to rely on things and, and, and these are biases or, or shortcuts that we take. Do you, how, how, you know, how, how do you help? I, I guess I don't want not to share anything. I, I'm trying to form this question, right? <laughs> but the, you have to get people to realize that they are broken not, not necessarily broken, but there's some there's some things from their past that they're going to have to change. Things they have to consciously think about for a extended period of time to to retrain that program. Yeah, and to start off with, it's awareness. So I don't know if you've ever seen that um, quantum physics uh, experiment where they were doing this experiment with particles, and they ran this experiment to watch what these particles did. And then what they did, they got cameras to watch how the particles did it. But when they did that, the outcome was completely different. And with understanding your own patterns, when you start actually being aware of, oh, look, I'm looking for that approval or, oh, gosh, I'm being emotional because, I, I, you know, this way I'm able to get that love that I want. And I feel, you know, that's my emotional home to be loved. Or, oh, gosh, I'm overachieving because otherwise I'm not going to be loved. You know, there's... Um, you start to understand yourself a little bit more. And it's a little bit like being able to understand how can you healthily get those needs met? And don't get me wrong, there's definitely healing, there's definitely different elements that we go through that help people, but they tend to be a couple of little shortcuts where people can start to actually identify, okay, what am I doing? What, how can I get this met by myself rather than external factors? Because often these stories come from this element of not being worthy not being worthy of love so when you start asking that question of okay who is worthy of love or who isn't worthy of love you suddenly realize everyone is yeah it's it's the if you go to like the superhero movie this is the part where the hero here has finally realized that you know, either I've got to fix myself, I've got this, right? So you start digging yourself out of, of whatever or start making those changes. And it's not always smooth. You, you know, it takes a long time to sort of get to the top of this arc here to sort of resolve this piece of that. It can do. I think this is, this all comes back to how you do it. Because I've had um, <laughs> one client, for example, um, who went through a significant amount of trauma, uh, significant. I don't think, um, I don't think many people go through this level of trauma, but cut a long story short, um, uh, there was something that happened that caused someone's life to end. Yeah, that's, 
that, that's pretty stark. <laughs> yeah, she had to, yeah. And um, she held on to that for 14 years. So it kind of proves, well, time's not a healer. Within 90 sessions with me, she took that intensity of that memory from nine out of 10 down to one. Wow. And that was actually something that was causing her to stop going into relationships. It was something that she was actually punishing herself for. It was, it was a memory that was causing her um, you know, so much pain where she was unable to fully connect with people. Yeah, built a wall around herself, it sounds yeah. like. Yeah, so. yeah. And within 90 minutes, we were able to sort that out and cure that. And when you start to actually understand how the mind fully works and you can start working around these elements, sometimes changes don't have to be this long, drawn-out, painful process we laughed through the 90 minutes you know don't get me wrong there's a few tears and stuff but there was elements that you know we don't have to go through like the martyr's journey yeah. <laughs> the martyr's journey. We as well yeah. which is important because my pe most people go oh gosh mental health or you know i've got to go and talk to someone people freak out understandably so you know because they often feel like they're almost um self-sacrificing going look i'm broken fix me <laughs> it's like no you just need to be aware and you know understand and what it is that you want and to get the right support to get you there. You know, there's such a stigma with, with that, a negative stigma that comes along with knowing that we're, we're all broken to some extent. There's nobody that's 100%. We're human. We're human. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and I think those people that, that you know, that it's, there's a stigma to it. Well, you can't, it's a weakness or, or what have you. We've been raised or culture, like you said, or, or the Facebook type thing is, is that nobody has that. And once you... You know, I, I know I'm broke. I, I spend more time going, well, that's just stupid. What, you know, what, what, what you do there? You know, I, 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 I do a lot of self-reflection, but, um, you know, so you were talking earlier about how you sort of pull different things, you know, from, from the, the way that you handle things, you, you, you sort of pull pick and pieces and you've created your own, uh, storyline here or your own tool set to do that. So to explain some of the other, some of the things that you've pulled together. Yeah, so one thing that's really important is being able to understand people's needs and fears. Because when you actually identify those, and this is a part of the profile, and we can do this, um, I actually teach people how to do this within six minutes. When we start doing things like this, we start to understand what drives behavior. So even think about, you know, the slight, you know, the, the smallest decisions that you make whether it's brushing your teeth it's like okay cool you're moving towards the goal of having fresh breath and being confident uh you're moving away from the high dentist bills the you know bad teeth and no confidence and all the rest of it so every tiny every tiny bit of you know behavior that we do is driven by these needs and fears so when you're able to identify them you start understanding the story of someone's life so you might go oh, okay well that person's got fear of abandonment so this means that they're going to need this kind of support or this kind of help. Or well, this person, um, they, they have a need for approval. So everything they do, they need a, a permission slip. Like, yes, go on, you can do that. Oh, great job. Yeah, go. Um, or there might be someone who feels a need in order to feel seen. They have a pity need. So they start listing out everything that's gone wrong and they've got a terrible day today and it's tough, it's just so tough. I just don't know how you do it. You know, they have this script that they need fulfilling. So when you start understanding all these different elements, you're able then to know what to work with in order to heal it, to start breaking down the patterns so they're able to get what they want. So whether it's that lovely dream relationship, whether that's the ability to, um, you know, have a family with the right kind of person or whether it's to be able just to love themselves and build the life up that they want. Because what we tend to find is as well, when people don't fully accept who they are and they don't fully accept the truth of who they are, what happens is they don't live out the truth of actually their reality that they're actually meant to go ahead and live. They, they stay restricted into the, um, into what society dictates 
and they wonder then why they're miserable or why they're in the wrong relationship or why um you know life's not feeling good or why they've got mental health problems it's because they've not been able to fully express their truth who they are and as a result they've not been able to create the life that they want or connect with the right kind of relationships well that's um yeah it's you you wonder what the world would look like if everybody or a majority of the people were free from that they they didn't live within those restraints that they put around themselves i, I you know a lot of people that they were that inner voice tells you again you're not worthy or, or your mind i call mine simon and you know he's a bully and he tells me i suck i mean he tells me things that i would never tell anybody else you know it's, it's that inner voice and it sounds like you have a way to sort of connect people with that inner voice to realize that you know, is it is it really true? You know, what what the voice is telling you, and ninety nine percent of the time, it's not. Exactly, and it's like it's coming back to this thing of you know when we, when we think about it, we are taught to think, and we're not taught to feel. So as soon as we get an emotion, or we get an internal dialogue, or anything like that, we get taught to shut it down or to logically think around it. No, you shouldn't feel angry about that because of this. <laughs> Um, uh, no, you shouldn't be thinking that way or whatever because of this. We logically move our way out of actually being ourselves. So what would happen if you, for example, spoke to Simon and said, well, Simon, what do you need? You know, what, what made you share that, that little insight there? What is it that you actually need? What is it that you're actually wanting out of this, uh, out of this mini talk? <laughs> <laughs> Often it always comes back to, I want you to be safe. Yeah. And when you're able, yeah, when you're able to go, great. So how can we do that together where I can be me, you can feel good <laughs> and we can move forward. Yeah. I talked to somebody else the other, a few weeks ago and they had a very similar story about it, is, is identifying what that need is. And he said, a lot of times the subconscious is protect us. You know, it's, it's evolved from, when we were in caves and there was danger around every corner to it's sort of bored now. So now it's got to make up other things to try to keep us safe from, <laughs> you know, it's, it's yeah. not, and, and it, it does sort of work against us. Now you talked about stories, the body language, you know, watching body language. Now I, I, I am horrible at that. Uh, you know, I, we were at a party many years ago and, and my, we were leaving my wife's in the car and she's you know, clearly upset at me and I'm, what, what, you know, what, 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 what I do? And, um, she said that, well, that girl, you know, I, I won't, I can't remember her name, but she was hitting on you. And I said, really, can, can we go back? Cause I kind of missed that. <laughs> <laughs> I missed the cue on that. There's so there's a lot of times that, that maybe we ignore body language or like me, I'm just totally oblivious to it. A lot of times. Mm, yeah. I mean, body language, it's super interesting because it's another dimension of communicating. So if you think about it, you've got people communicate via messages and texts and emails, um, uh, you know, so you get that. So when you suddenly talk to someone on the phone, you've got this new level of connection, you understand someone slightly differently. When you see them in person, it's different again. And when you see their body language, it's different again. It's kind of like getting that extra little bit of information each time. And one thing that's really interesting, when you start playing around with body language, you connect with people differently. So for example, if I wanted you to get really excited about something, well, all of a sudden I'm gonna bring my hands up and I'm gonna talk about these different things, and move my hands around a little bit more, and we're gonna amplify that conversation just by putting my hands up. And um, uh, that's something that's really, really just simple about changing the dynamics of just using your physical body language. And the other thing is, when you start looking at things, for example, like blink rate, and you're going to suddenly be like, oh my gosh, I need to be co you know, conscious of my blink rate now. <laughs> yeah, now I'm thinking about that right so now. So I know, <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> so when we, when we think about blink rate, the average blinks per, um, per minute is 12. So that's usually sort of a baseline behavior. As soon as we start um, slowing down our blink rate, something like four you know, blinks per minute or something like that, it shows that we're really interested in the conversation. If we start raising our blink rate, 
so something a lot higher than 12 um, blinks per minute, well, that will actually show there's disinterest. So uh, that can give you a little bit of a few different cues of how to start moving that conversation around. Or if I'm noticing, okay, blink rate scan, I'm gonna ask you a question about your feedback or what you're thinking about this, or I'm gonna change the conversation completely to get your engagement back. So that's just something very, very simple that you can look out for. It's very powerful. Well, now I'm gonna be thinking about that the rest of my day is how many times <laughs> am I blinking and counting that? Oh, I'm sorry, I wasn't it's listening. Like I was matrix. counting my blinks, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but but you, but you're right about the body language as a public speaker. I do that a lot. You know, I move around a lot and I watch the audience to see is, is their heads nodding? Are they leaning in? Are they, you know, something else? So there, there are things I'm, I'm not totally oblivious to things. Maybe it's just things with my wife that I'm oblivious to. But, um, you know, it's it, <laughs> it is an important part of the story. And that's why people were challenged over the last couple of years. And, you know, you had this four inch square or three inch square of somebody's, you know, from the neck up which that's like 99% of, um, of, the, of the time, you're missing that language. You're missing that unseen stuff. So, I mean, that gets to be um, the challenge. So that's an important thing. So wh where can, you, know, so we, we, you? it sounds like if I had to sort of sum it up here is you help people identify where they're at in their story and give them some tools on how they might be able to change the story to what they, you know, one, identify what they want, what they really want, because a lot of people can't tell you what they want. But then once they do that, how you can sort of put them on a path to achieve that. Is that sort of a, you know, you're, you're sort yeah, of the... That's, that's phase one. That's, uh, <laughs> wow. Okay. So we got to have like some, several more podcasts here to get going. <laughs> I know. I know. This is good. <laughs> Yeah, phase two would be understanding who they're compatible with and how they can go and meet that person, whether it's online, whether it's um, organically. Um, and like I said, people meet people really, really quickly when they know the right way to do that. And then the last phase is actually how they can go on to create a healthy relationship that's right for them and their partner. So we actually um, have a course which we actually invite the partners onto. Um, so they're able to create this long lasting relationship together. And I think that's the important part. It's not this secret game playing rubbish. It's actually how do you create a genuine, honest relationship um, as a team? Yeah, I, I can tell you after 40 years of marriage that there is, like I said, you can't game this thing. It's it's a constant adaptation, uh, a listening for, and for me, it's, it's saying, I'm sorry, yes, dear, and having a florist on speed dial. So that's- <laughs> Love it. <laughs> That's some tips I've learned over time. But um, how do people get a hold of you if you want to go on to say if they need help with phase one or if they're they're ready for phase two or three? How can people get a hold of you? Yeah, so people can find us um, on our website. Uh, that's lovewithintelligence.com. Um, we've also got things like a radio show. We're on YouTube, we're on Facebook, we're on Instagram. Um, so, yeah, come and check us out. It's all at lovewithintelligence.com. Cool, and we'll put that in the show notes. So, Lily, this has been a great way to start my day. I hope it's been a great way to end your day. And I've, you know, I've learned a few things as well. So, anytime I can walk away learning a few things, it's a great day. Oh, thank you so much for having me. I've really enjoyed it. Thank you.